Hi, I'm Scott, and this is my wife, Christina, and this is our story of redemption. Uh, we didn't necessarily start out the right way. We had a child a month after we graduated high school. We waited eight months to get married so that we got married for the right reasons. And we had three children. And when our son, Brett, our youngest, was 13 months old, that's when our life was changed. So this was an ordinary day like any other day. Scott's parents were going to watch the kids for us while I went to work. So I had left the car seat so she could um, take the baby with her when she left. And so she was out putting the car seat in the car and Brett was out there with her in between her and the car. And most of you know that if you're not experienced putting in a car seat, it's a struggle sometimes. And she was struggling with that car seat and Brett snuck away from her and was running, chasing after my dad who had already gotten in his truck and started to back out when he ran him over. Uh, yeah, I, I was at work and um, I got a phone call that, you know, no mother wants to hear um, that my son had been hit and I needed to get to the hospital. So I rushed into the emergency room where um, I went up to the nurse and told her I was there to see my son. And I remember her, instead of taking me back into one of the, the emergency rooms, she took me aside into the side room and I, in my mind, I'm thinking, why is she doing this? And when I got inside, um, our whole family had gotten there before me and was already sitting in there and told me that um, Brett had passed. And um, at that point, I just remember that I couldn't breathe and I felt like I didn't have any air. So I ran out of the room and went into the parking lot and just started asking God to help me and help me get through it. And um, I remember very clearly that they said to me, you need to go back into that room and you need to tell those parents, those grandparents that you forgive them. And I just looked at it, I, you know, I looked up to him and I said, God, I can't do that. I said, I think I can do that one day, but I can't do it right now. I just found out that my son died. And he said, no, you need to go do that now. And so um, I said, okay. I went back in and I um, knelt in front of Scott's parents and I said, I don't remember my exact words, but it was, um, I know you guys are great grandparents. I know you love my kids and I don't hold this against you. Um, I forgive you and I would trust you with my other kids. Um, and I just think that that really helped to start the healing process in the entire family at that point. So I had to watch all of this firsthand, and let me tell you, it was the uh, most courageous thing I think I've ever seen in my life. And it's not only that she went and said that to my parents at that time, but it's that she lived it out immediately. There was never a delay in my parents being able to watch my other kids. We still always got together. There was never any animosity. And I think that moment in time is what triggered us to have healing, to uh, have redemption, and to have recovery. And um, it led to members of our family coming to know Christ through this experience. And that was the greatest joy. So this was an event that could have destroyed our family our marriage, uh, our relationship with my parents, but because God gave us grace and we were able to extend grace, it brought about healing and restoration. Now we have grandkids of our own and it's such a blessing to be able to um, have a, another chance to just uh, watch them grow and, and be a family. And so I just am really grateful for what God has brought us through. And I just pray that he can use that to encourage someone else that's really struggling. Because when you're in the middle of a struggle, when you're, when you're in that, it feels hopeless and it doesn't feel like there's any way out. And, but, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you that God can 
take a tragic situation and he can give you hope again. And if you just trust him, if you know his character, just remember who he is and um, believe that he can yeah, work all things for good. God redeemed our tragedy and he could redeem yours too. I'm so glad that you are here today. Today we're continuing to move forward in our sermon series, Unleashed. And as you have seen in the video, we're now moving from our sermons, we're now moving out of the more financial-driven sermons to more of the topical-driven uh, sermons uh, dealing with issues and life, uh, life issues that many of us struggle with. And, and we want to help you really as a church be unleashed from some difficult things in your life. We want to welcome our Parker campus who is joining us. We are one church in three locations. And Parker, we love you and we're glad that you're here. And we hope and pray God continues to move among you. Today we're going to be looking at several passages of Scripture, but our main Scripture focus is found in Proverbs 19.11. And if you do not have a Bible, uh, we want to encourage you, uh, you can use the Bible located underneath the seat in front of you, and you can turn to page 642. As always, if you do not have a Bible that you can read and understand easily, we want to encourage you, take that Bible home with you. Take it home with you, read it, and apply it to your life. We are fully convinced if we read God's Word and apply God's Word, He will change our lives. Robert has always already mentioned about Night to Shine and saying thank you, and I want to echo that as well. It was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. So thank you, all the volunteers that helped uh, from my heart to yours. It was incredible, and I'm so glad that you were a part of that. It was such a great thing. Today, we're addressing anger and forgiveness. As I said, we're going to be looking at many passages of Scripture. And as I'm able to, if I don't forget, as I move along in the sermon, I will give you the page number and the references as we move along. So let's talk about anger. Anger. Boy, anger is one of the things that can really devastate and ruin relationships long term. Many people won't even speak to family members that they grew up with for periods of years because they're angry with them. Or maybe the other one is angry at them. Proverbs is chock full of verses about anger, but Proverbs 19.11 has to be the one verse that I have experienced a lot of life change through. Proverbs 19.11 says this, Good sense makes one slow to anger. And it is to his glory to overlook an offense. Now, it's important that we understand right away when we're addressing anger tonight, we are not talking about righteous anger. Uh, righteous anger is really God's anger towards things that uh, are injustices. Uh, maybe human trafficking, God's anger towards that. Or, or maybe injustice about if people are treated poorly based on who they are, how God has wired them, the color of their skin, their socioeconomic status. That, that's injustice. We're not talking about getting angry over the things, those righteous anger topics. Uh, to be honest, I'm not holy enough to, to think that I even demonstrate righteous anger at times. I might be watching the news channel and I might get disgusted with human trafficking, but I don't know that I've ever fully experienced that righteous anger uh, when the Bible refers to that. So when we're talking about anger, we're not addressing social injustice. We're not talking about the righteous anger that God has and that some people show. Like Martin Luther King Jr. demonstrated that righteous anger and he did it in a controlled way. That he's one that as he led the civil rights movement, he's one that demonstrated a, a righteous anger, God's righteous anger over injustice. And again, I confess, 
I don't have the holiness for that. I feel like I struggle enough with anger without even wrestling with righteous anger. Righteous anger is right anger, but usually the anger I experience is jolly anger. Uh, it, it's, it's anger that just kind of wells up in my own heart. So the type of anger that I want you to be unleashed from, the type of anger that I want us all to be unleashed from, is the type of anger that defines us. See, we must understand that uncontrolled anger is a character issue. Uncontrolled anger is a character issue. Now, my dad had a temper. You've heard me share my story a number of times. It was visible. His temper was visible and it was frightening. I was afraid of my dad when he would get angry. If I knew I got a bad grade in school, I was afraid to go home. Now, not just because I would get punished, but because he would be angry. His anger was rarely controlled. I can still see the look on my dad's face. He's been dead since 1997. I can still see the look on his face as he would yell at me, as he would call me names, when he would stomp his feet in anger and scream and yell. He would break furniture when he was angry. He would call me names when he was angry. Uncontrolled anger was a very common occurrence in my house. When I thought of my dad, I thought of anger. When I think of my dad today, I remember his anger. Now, I was not the issue. Yeah, I made mistakes. Yeah, I got bad grades. Yeah, I got in trouble at school. Yeah, I picked on my brothers and sisters. But I was not the issue, even though my dad wanted me to think and believe that I was. My brothers and sisters were not the issue. My mother was not the issue. It wasn't how she cooked food or if she cooked food wrong. That was not the issue. It was not whether the house was clean or dirty that was the issue. It was a character issue in my dad. Even though he pointed the finger at me and my mom and my brothers and sisters, even though he pointed his finger at work or the bar or the beer or the alcohol, those things were not the issue. It was his character. That was the issue. So if you're presently around a boss or an employer or a family member, a spouse or a parent, or maybe you grew up around somebody that had uncontrolled anger, please believe me when I tell you, even if you feel like you're at fault, their anger issue is not your issue. It's their character issue. So if you feel responsible, if you feel like you're to blame, I want to help free you from that. You're not. When somebody practices uncontrolled anger, it is within their character. It's a character issue for them. So pray for them to experience life change. As followers of Jesus, we believe that we reflect God's character and God's character is gracious. God's character is loving. God's character is forgiving. And so pray for them. Pray for those individuals in your life who have anger issues and pray that God would set them free from that and that they would experience the ultimate character makeover by becoming a follower of Jesus. So a little reflection time, if you will. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And if you don't, I'm going to get angry. <laughs> raise your hand if you can confess that there were uncontrolled anger issues in your family as a child. Okay. Raise your hand if you know somebody now that seems to lose their temper often. Okay. Now raise your hand if you used to see that angry person looking back at you in the mirror. Aren't you glad for life change? I mean, that's what Jesus does. Any of us who used to struggle with anger issues will be the first ones that will admit and will confess that Jesus changes lives. That those anger issues that we once struggled with, God changes. He transforms. And I'm grateful for that. As a kid, I was a teen, as a kid and a teenager, I did not hang, handle anger very well either. I would punch walls. I literally broke my hand, my left hand, by punching a fire extinguisher. St 
stupid. <laughs> I'd punch trees. I would punch people. I would throw, as a, even as a teenager, I would stomp my feet and scream and yell and try to intimidate people when I would become angry. I was sent to an adolescent psychiatric hospital for three months with anger being the main issue that I had to go deal with. As a kid, I learned to deal with anger the very same way that I observed how my father reacted in anger. I was becoming a, a little dad. I, I was blowing up at everything. My brothers and sisters, my parents, or my uh, people at school. Even after I left the, uh, the psychiatric hospital, until I became a follower of Christ, I never dealt with my anger properly. Little silly things would set me off. Now, if I was working on my car and I couldn't get the bolt to turn, or if the bolt did turn and my hand slipped, I got angry. I would lose my temper. If I felt like I'd been insulted by somebody at school, I would lose my temper and I would get into a fight at school. I was known to be hot-headed. I was an angry teenager. But when I experienced that way maker change in my life, when I experienced that promise keeper changing my life, when I experienced the presence of God in my life for the first time, when I received Christ as my Savior and Lord, my character changed. My character, that old man died, and the new character began to grow in my heart. I changed. I thought differently. And because I thought differently, I acted differently. Little things did not bother me any longer. Little things did not set me off any longer because God's Holy Spirit had moved into my heart and changed my mind. My character was changed. I was born again and my character was made new. And because of that day in July of 1991 when I trusted Jesus as my Savior, I can honestly tell you that I am no longer known by the people who know me best as an angry man. Jesus changed me. Thank God for life change. But like you, I still get angry. Like you, I still get upset. Like you, I still can be, uh, 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 allow anger sometimes to get the best of me. So what do we do when we get angry? What do we do when we literally get so bothered by somebody that we can't even speak? We, we get upset. So I want us to go back and read Proverbs 19, 11 again. Good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. If you want to be unleashed from uncontrolled anger, practice the wisdom of Proverbs 19.11. When angered, good sense asks. See, when angered, our good sense has got to kick in. When we become angry, we've got to be able to stop and allow the emotions of being angry die and allow our mind, which is the mind of Christ, to take over. That's good sense. Good sense will prevent us from blowing our top. Good sense prevents us from digging out Mr. Potato Head angry eyes and sticking them on our heads. Good sense prevents us from losing our temper and ruining relationships. Good sense slows us down from getting angry. Good sense is discretion, and we all have it. We all have discretion and good sense. You know why you don't stick your, fan into, uh, your finger into a fan when it's going at a high rate of speed? Because you have good sense, right? Uh, because you've good, you have good sense, you do not tie concrete blocks around your ankles before you go swimming in the channel. You have good sense. Because you have good sense, you don't drink Clorox bleach when you're thirsty. You have good sense. And you know what good sense does? Good sense tells us not to do dumb things. And we all have it. We all practice it. 
But when we become angry, that's when it's most crucial to practice good sense. See, good sense asks questions. Good sense considers other people's viewpoints. Good sense reflects on yourself and on the situation. Good sense ponders deeply. So the next time you sense anger beginning to grow in your heart, I want to encourage you to ask two questions rooted in good sense. Ask yourself, am I defensive because I know I'm wrong? And am I defiant because I think I'm right? Most of the times when I get angry, these two questions completely diffuse me. Most of the time, I get defensive. If, if I'm going to get angry, I, I begin to get defensive. And we know how we all act when we're defensive. I, I, I did not do that. I did not say that. Well, you should have done this or you shouldn't have said that. We become defensive. Yet I know I'm wrong. And I'm trying to put up this front like I'm right. And so I grow even more defensive trying to protect what? My reputation? I grow more defensive trying to protect what? My ego? What's all that rooted in? It's all rooted in pride, isn't it? Or then I ask, anybody else do that? You get defensive when you're angry because you know you're wrong and you don't want to admit it? And the second question is, am I defiant because I think I'm right? Well, I know I'm right, right? I know I'm right and you are so wrong. It's all rooted in pride. It's all rooted in, in arrogance. See, sometimes we respond in anger because we refuse to admit we are wrong. So we react defensively. Isn't that a dumb thing to do? I mean, it really is. If good sense, when used, protects us from doing dumb things, then we can honestly say when we're not practicing good sense, we're going to do dumb things. And it's a dumb thing to be defensive about something when we know we are wrong. One of the greatest three words I ever learned after I became a Christian was, I was wrong. And not just learning them, but saying them. When you can admit that you are wrong about issues in your life, you protect your relationships with other people. So let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if you love winning an argument with anybody. Raise your hand if you've ever heard the words, I told you so, said to you. Raise your hand if you've ever said the words, I told you so. Did you say them today? <laughs> See, to ask and answer those two questions honestly requires a reflective and humble spirit. Are you willing to admit that the possibility exists that you are indeed wrong? See, if we do understand the impact that sin has on our lives, I know as followers of Jesus, we've been set free from sin. We've been set free from the punishment for our sin. But st sin still impacts us. Sin still, sin, sin still can grab a hold of us and impact us and cause hurt and pain in our own hearts and in our family's hearts. And when we understand this impact of sin, we understand easily that we are not perfect. And if I love and relish being right, it's because I'm a sinner. And if I hate that somebody else is right and I'm wrong, it's because I'm prideful. If I feel like I have to prove somebody else is wrong, it's because I don't love like I need to love and like I ought to be loving. Now, I understand it's difficult to be reflective when you're angry, right? So uh, we know that we're not all, you know, Pope John Paul the Twelfth or whatever. We know that we're not all perfect, and I don't think we stop. Uh, I don't think we can really expect people to immediately stop. Oh, I'm angry. Let me be reflective. Um, you know, <laughs> let me think about this. But because uncontrolled anger is a character issue, 
I want to give you a memory verse that you can tuck into your heart. And if you memorize this verse, you are going to find that the Holy Spirit will remind you of this verse the next time that you're angry. It's just going to happen because the Spirit of God loves you and he wants to help you. This memory verse is found on page 1199. It's James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. James says... You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. See, if we are quick to listen, we slow our speech. If we're quick to listen, we slow our anger. And in the words of Judge Judy, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. If you struggle with anger, listen more. Now, after you've reflected on those two questions, if you conclude that you indeed have been wronged, I want to remind you that it is still not your role to play junior Holy Spirit to everybody that crosses your path. It's not your role to convict the world of sin. That's God's job. Your role is to reflect the character of Jesus. See, we've become a society that's offended and outraged at everything. Everybody gets offended. Everybody gets outraged. Uh, Don't be like that. You can turn on the news channels and watch people be offended and argue with each other for 30 minutes. Don't be like that. You know what we had to do the last election cycle? We had to turn off the news in our house. Because our girls would hear the arguing back and forth on both sides. And then I would see my girls begin to argue back and forth with one another. We don't need that in our lives. We live in a society that everybody is offended and everyone is outraged. But God has called followers of Jesus to live differently. Now, if you've understood that you've offended God because of your sin, and if you've accepted his forgiveness, if you've received Jesus as your Savior, and you've committed your life to follow him, then you have a responsibility to overlook offenses as much as possible. See, if you are a follower of Jesus, it's not your role to convict the world of sin, but it is your role to overlook offenses as often as you can. Ephesians 4.2, the Apostle Paul said this, Always, there's a word always, you want to circle that word when you read that verse, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. As followers of Jesus, we can look to Jesus to see how he responded when he was offended and when he was hurt and when people took up rocks to stone him and when they nailed him to the cross. He chose the path of forgiveness. He overlooked the offenses. Why? Because he was humble, gentle, and patient with others. See, you and I need to even be more so patient and humble and gentle with others because we're not Jesus. Because we're not Jesus, we've got to slow down and we've got to overlook the offenses of other people and because you and I know that you and I have bad days. You and I get irritable. You and I aren't always humble and gentle and we need other followers of Jesus to be humble and gentle and to overlook our offenses when we are not. See, for no particular reason, some people in this room may get moody one day. They may just get irritable. They woke up on the wrong side of bed. Their hair doesn't look right. Their breath doesn't smell right. Their kids aren't acting right. And for no particular reason at all, sometimes our spouses are irritable. It's not because we did anything wrong. They're just more irritable. And because they're more irritable, we walk on eggshells. I mean, we're humble and we're gentle. We don't have to play Holy Spirit and point out the things that they're doing wrong. 
We overlook them. See, I get more irritable with others when I get in a higher stress situation. Uh, especially as a dad when I'm working with my kids and if my kids get hurt and then another one gets hurt and then I'm in a high stress situation and I've got something cooking on the stove and the dog's barking out the window and that stupid vent fan is on and it's running full blast. I I mean, it's just a high stress and I get more irritable. And so then little Jesse, my six-year-old, will come out and say, Daddy, and I go, what? You know, because I'm stressed. We need to be able to overlook the offenses of other people. To, be sh- to show kindness and show gentleness, we need to overlook offenses as much as possible. So if I know I can be grumpy and irritable, others get that freedom too. Now, I'm not saying that we go out the door and everybody says, well, you need to forgive me because I'm just having a bad day. No, we need to be practicing, right, fruit of the Spirit in our lives and letting that grow But if I can be grumpy and irritable, other people too. And that's why we make allowance for others' faults. And finally, we need to respond gently to angry people and receive blessings. Proverbs 15.1 says, A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words make tempers flare. See, I have news for you. A gentle answer is not a patronizing answer. A gentle answer is not dripping with sarcasm. A gentle answer is sincerely given in love. Have you ever noticed that if somebody is angry with you, you can say the wrong thing and make it worse? (laughs) What's your problem? That's a great one, right? (laughs) Or, I'm so sorry. Does that make it worse or better? Yeah, but yet if it's said gently, I am so sorry. Same words. When we respond gently, it deflects anger. It turns anger away. When we say it gently and we say those words sincerely, That gentle answer can be a blessing, not only to you and to your future, but to that individual that's upset with you. 1 Peter 3, 9 on page 1205 says this, Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will bless you for it. So respond gently to other people. Respond with kindness towards other people when they're angry. If it's your spouse, if it's your children, if it's a boss, respond gently and humbly and you will be blessed as a result. So control your anger by walking in a spirit of humility. And when people throw on those angry eyes and get mad at you, Respond gently. Hopefully, you'll quench their anger and put it out. As God's people, let's pray together. God, we want to ask that you would help us in all the areas that we struggle with, but especially, Lord, in the area of anger. Lord, we know that anger can ruin relationships. A lack of forgiveness can just completely damage relationships for a long period of time. And Father, we're grateful for the testimony that we heard today. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to help us be a people that quickly forgive, that graciously show kindness. Help us, God, to become a people that you want us to be and keep changing our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.